the Simon Center. I'm not sure how many of you were here before. Since we have, you know, we bus many high school uh, people from uh, Long Island. Today is a really momentous occasion because it's the first time that uh, we have that uh, the La Pietra lecture coincides a few mo in a few months with a Nobel Prize in physics. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, remarkable that Keith Thorne, uh, well, he's one of the, the major actors in general relativity over the last uh, 50 years. And since you can, you probably all know about Wikipedia and about Google and so on, if you want to know more about his uh, biography, I think that you can look it up on the web. And uh, I prefer to give more time to him to explain his particular lecture. Please keep. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here to, to talk particular exploring black holes and exploring the Big Bang, the birth of the universe, and a few other things. Uh, let me again begin 1.3 billion years ago uh, when here on Earth, multicell life was just forming and beginning to spread over the Earth, but in a galaxy far, far away. Two black holes were circling around each other. This is what that would have looked like to your eyes if you were there. This is from a computer simulation. You see the shadows of the two black holes against a field of many, many stars far behind them. But you also see a swirling pattern, which is caused because the light rays, the light coming from the stars, bend around the black holes, may even come in and go around the black holes a few times before it comes to your eyes. And this is that, that means the black holes lack like sort of really weird lenses, like in a funhouse, to produce these apparent swirling patterns. Uh, and so in this simulation, you see the two black holes go around and around each other, but they're gradually spiraling together because they're emitting gravitational waves, which I will explain a little bit later. These waves carry off energy, and as they carry off energy, the black holes are driven to spiral together, and ultimately they come crashing together uh, in a huge cataclysmic uh, event, producing a strong burst of gravitational waves, so strong that the total power output that came out, uh, the amount of energy per unit time, was 50 times larger than the total power produced by all the stars in the universe put together. Just think of that, 50 times the luminosity of all the stars in the universe put together, but in the form of this gravitational radiation or gravitational waves, not in the form of light. But it came off so quickly that the total energy that came off was not all that big. It's just the energy you would get by taking three suns and annihilating them completely and turning all of their mass into gravitational wave energy. That's not quite as impressive as 50 times the power of all the stars in the universe put together. But this enormous burst then went traveling out of the galaxy in which those uh, uh, black holes lived into intergalactic space, across the great reaches of intergalactic space. And uh, uh, is, does, is this good enough? For, is, are the lights all right up here? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't mind having the lights on? You can see this okay. okay. So, uh, and 50,000 years ago, when our, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, this burst of gravitational waves entered our Milky Way galaxy. For 50,000 years, those waves traveled across the Milky Way galaxy, and on 14th of September, 2015, they arrived at Earth. They entered the Earth uh, near the Antarctic Peninsula, near the South Pole. They traveled up through the Earth, unscathed, unaffected by all the mass in the Earth. They emerged from inside the Earth at a gravitational wave detector called LIGO uh, in Livingston, Louisiana, sort of halfway between uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Seven milliseconds later, seven one thousandth of a second later, they emerged through the Earth at a gravitational wave detector in Hanford, Washington. Uh, they shook these gravitational wave detectors in a manner that I will describe in a few minutes, uh, producing then in them a signal that was analyzed for several months by a thousand scientists associated with this LIGO uh, collaboration. These are just a few of the scientists at uh, several different locations. And uh, they, the scientists then, of which I, I am a member of this team, uh, analyzed that and had to make absolutely sure that what we were seeing were 
the influence of gravitational waves because gravitational waves had never ever been seen before by human beings. And after a few months of analysis, we wrote a paper, published it, and it made front page headlines in all the major newspapers around the world and a lot of much smaller newspapers. It was just the, the biggest news of the day uh, when it was announced on the 11th of February, uh, 2016. The, this quickly became a cultural event. This is not a drawing, it's not a painting, it's a photograph of two people in the subway in New York City, a uh, photograph taken by the uh, nephew of a colleague of mine who invented these gravitational waves. Scientists have found gravitational waves in outer space, if only it were that w easy to find an apartment in New York City with a walk-in closet. And also on the day we announced the result, there was a cartoon in the New Yorker that came out that day, February 12th, the day after we announced the result. The sound, if you were to put the gravitational wave sound on a loudspeaker, it would sound like a chirp. It would go whoop. And so two black hole, two, two, two birds are sitting on this branch and one of them says to the other, was that you I heard just now or was it two black holes colliding? So this became part of the popular culture, actually, uh, around the world very, very quickly, which surprised me enormously and pleased me since I'd been working on this for 50 years, for half a century myself, as did Ray Weiss. So let me say a little bit about how we got here. This begins with Albert Einstein. In 1915, he proposed a new explanation for gravity. He said that space and time are warped by the mass and the energy that are uh, in the universe, for example, by the mass of the Earth or by the mass of the, uh, two, these two black holes. And uh, that warping produces the gravity that holds us to the surface of the Earth, but that warping has many, many other manifestations. And uh, about a year after he proposed this theory, well, less than a year, a few months, uh, he uh, made the prediction that uh, one of the things that can be produced by this warping, accompanying this warping, is a gravitational wave. And he said a gravitational wave is the following. If you ha are out in outer space and you just lay out a grid of particles just fre freely floating, so you just put a particle here, one there, one there, one there, some up here, and you're in outer space where if they're laid down at rest with respect to each other, they should always remain at rest with respect to each other, but that's not what happens. When a gravitational wave comes by and it propagates through uh, this array of particles, say into the screen, it stretches and squeezes the particles in this manner. It stretches space, and space then stretches the distance between the particles, uh, stretching along one direction and squeezing along the other direction in an oscillatory stretch and squeeze. A more precise description is that if you have an inertial reference frame over here, using some language from physics, and you have another inertial reference frame over there, when the gravitational waves go by, the inertial reference frames are pushed back and forth relative to each other, something that would never ever happen in uh, Newton's uh, description of the nature of the universe or Galileo's descriptions, uh, but does happen according to Einstein. Einstein also said, wrote in this paper that, uh, where he proposed these waves, he wrote in effect that these waves from any conceivable uh, source in the universe will be so weak that humans will probably never ever be able to detect them. But half a century later approximately, Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland had the guts, the courage to go out and start looking for them. What had happened in the intervening time is that we learned about objects that exist in the universe that Einstein didn't know about uh, back in 1916, black holes and neutron stars, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And new technology was also, uh, had also been developed, lasers, computers, and, and so forth. And so it was a whole new world in terms of possibilities for going after gravitational waves. And so Joe, who was a close friend of mine, uh, sat down and designed and built gravitational wave detectors whose details I won't talk about because he didn't see any waves, but he became the motivation for me and for others to start thinking seriously about gravitational waves. So in 1966, I finished my graduate studies at Princeton and moved to Caltech out in Pasadena, California, and started building a group of theoretical physicists 
working on the theory of black holes and neutron stars, neither of which had ever been seen at that time, uh, and the theory of gravitational waves. And one of the things that my students and I particularly began, began thinking about was if you can succeed in detecting these waves and using them to extract information that they carry, what would you be able to learn about the universe? Uh, and so in 1972, we wrote a technical paper that laid out a vision for the future of what is now called gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, and we said, look, there's a big contrast between electromagnetic waves, which are the kinds of waves that have been used up until now to study the universe, that's light, x-rays, radio waves, and so forth, and these gravitational waves. Gra electromagnetic waves are oscillations of the electric and magnetic fields that propagate through space as time passes. Whereas gravitational waves are oscillations of the very fabric of space and time itself. Enormously different physical phenomena. Electromagnetic waves are incoherent superpositions. This is a technical phrase, I don't want to go into the details, but incoherent superpositions uh, of emission from particles and atoms and molecules that are electrically charged. So you have to have an electric charge oscillating to produce these electromagnetic waves, whereas gravitational waves are produced coherently, that is, in, uh, in, by the bulk motion of large amounts of matter or energy, such as the colliding black holes. Electromagnetic waves are much too easily absorbed and scattered by matter between us and the source. Gravitational waves are never significantly absorbed or scattered, even near the birth of the universe despite the very high density and temperature of the matter in the early universe, travel right through them just as the waves traveled right through the Earth. And so because of these enormous differences, it seemed obvious to us that many sources of gravitational waves will not be seen with the electromagnetic waves. And that was the case with these colliding black holes, 50 universe luminosities in gravitational waves. Nothing was seen with optical telescopes, radio telescopes, x-ray telescopes. But there also would be, uh, we concluded, many sources that would be seen by both. And I'll give you an example of colliding neutron stars near the end of the talk. Uh, another conclusion from this is that huge surprises are likely. Every time we've had a new way of observing the universe, we began with light, and then the 1950s, uh, radio telescopes were built, and we started to study with radio telescopes. Uh, in the 1970s, X-ray telescopes began to uh, teach us about the universe. Each time we had a new way of observing the universe, there were enormous surprises. And here there are bound to be enormous surprises because of the huge difference between the two types of waves. 1972, the same year as Bill Press, my student and I, laid out a vision for what you might do with gravitational wave detection. Uh, Rainer Weiss, or Ray as I call him, at MIT uh, proposed a new type of gravitational wave detector, the type in which we, uh, uh, that we have actually built, the LIGO gravitational wave detectors. Let me just say that Ray and I were together at Princeton. I was a graduate student. He was a postdoctoral student uh, in the uh, early to mid-1960s, so we knew each other. Uh, and we were then working in parallel, I as a theorist and he as an experimenter. Uh, and he proposed a design where you take mirrors, four mirrors, hanging from overhead supports, and when the gravitational wave comes along, it pushes these two mirrors together because it's squeezing space along that direction, pushes these apart because it's stretching space along this direction. And then that oscillates. And he proposed using laser beams to monitor that squeezing along one direction and uh, stretching along the other, a technique called interferometry. So these are called gravitational interferometers. I don't want to go into the details of interferometry. Some of you will have uh, learned a little bit about that in physics classes, I suspect. But the key thing is you're losing, using laser beams, laser light, to monitor this motion. Uh, Ray, quite interestingly, did not publish this uh, idea in the regular scientific literature. He wrote a technical report, a remarkable thing, where he identified all of the sources of noise, the major sources of noise that you would have in such a detector. He described how to deal with each of them. He made estimates, 
of how uh, much you could reduce that noise and therefore what the sensitivity of these detectors would be, how weak a waves you could uh, make. And it was really, really a tour de force. He wrote it in a technical report that was in an internal MIT a series of technical reports, but he sent copies around to all his colleagues. This is not the way other people would behave. Other people would immediately publish the idea in a scientific journal in order to make sure they got the credit. But Ray believed that you should not publish something like this until you've detected gravitational waves. And so he would have had to wait. Let's see, this is 1972, uh, if he had really followed that authoring a textbook on gravitation called, uh, on, on relativity called Gravitation with Charles Misner and John Wheeler. Uh, and uh, I'd not yet studied his paper, his uh, technical paper. I had not yet uh, talked with him in any depth. Uh, but I just looked at the numbers and I said to myself, this is crazy. This is stupid. And so I was very careful with the wording in this textbook. I wrote that it is not promising instead of it's crazy and stupid. And then ultimately, I spent most of my career trying to help him make this a success, trying to make it happen. So, so why did I think it was crazy and stupid? Let me give you some numbers about how big the motion of these mirrors is produced by a realistic source of gravitational wave. So these are my estimates and those of my students and colleagues for how strong the waves would be bathing the Earth. If I begin with one centimeter, I divide by 100, you get the thickness of a human hair. Divide by another factor of 100, you get the wavelength of the light that is used in our gravitational wave detectors. So that's the wavelength of the light that's bouncing back and forth. Uh, and uh, you divide by 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom. Divide by 100,000, you get the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Divide by 1,000, you get the size of the mirror motions that we were expecting to see. That is a trillion times smaller than the wavelength of light. And it just seemed totally crazy to me that anybody would ever be able to measure motions using light that were a trillion times smaller than the wavelength of light. It just seemed outrageous. Until I studied his paper in great depth, I talked in detail with him, particularly when we were in Washington, D.C. together for a committee meeting, the committee he was chairing, and I was just talking to the committee. Uh, we spent all night long in, in his hotel room in Washington, D.C., talking about this. And I talked in great depth with Vladimir Baginsky, a superb Russian experimental physicist uh, with whom I was beginning to develop a tight collaboration in uh, the early to mid-1970s. And then I became convinced. But it took me uh, about three years to become convinced. Once I was convinced that this had a serious possibility of succeeding, uh, then I uh, convinced Caltech, my home university, that we should build a group working on this uh, alongside, in parallel with Ray Weiss's group at MIT. We brought a man named Ronald Drever from Glasgow, Scotland, who had invented some very clever improvements on Ray Weiss's ideas for these detectors. We brought him to Caltech to lead this effort and brought Stan Whitcomb, a younger uh, uh, man, to uh, co-lead it with him. Stan became the chief scientist, has been the chief scientist of the LIGO project throughout almost all of the project. Uh, and, and Stan uh, at Caltech and a set of young scientists there built a 40 meter interferometer, something where the distance between the mirrors was 40 meters. So uh, that is, uh, what, it's nearly half a football field length distance. That is 1% the size of the interferometers that we thought we needed in order to have success. So they built this prototype interferometer uh, in the 88-83 time frame, while Ray Weiss and his group at MIT were working with a much shorter prototype interferometer, 1.5 meters. But more importantly, they carried out a feasibility study for could you really build something that was several kilometers long? Uh, what were all the things that could go wrong and just in terms of the engineering aspects of it. Uh, and uh, uh, then we went to NSF with the results of that feasibility study, which were quite promising, uh, some rough estimates of how much it would cost, uh, together with the results uh, from these prototype interferometers, Caltech, MIT, Glasgow, Scotland, 
and, and uh, in Munich or, uh, or Garking, Germany. And so four interferometers around the world that uh, were being uh, developed, patterned after Ray's original ideas. And in 1984, then, uh, we made a collaboration between Caltech and MIT to do this uh, under the auspices of the National Science Foundation and a man named Richard Isaacson who uh, was our, in some sense, our bureaucrat in Washington, except he had done some superb work on the theory of gravitational waves. He gave the definitive explanation of the energy carried by gravitational waves before he went to the National Science Foundation. And the project was led from 1984 by uh, the three of us, Ray Weiss, Ron Drever, and me. We were probably the worst leadership of any big project that has ever been put together. And so uh, the NSF did an in-depth study of this. Should we really invest what turned out in the end to be a billion dollars on this project? Uh, is it really worth doing this? Uh, and uh, is it really feasible? Uh, can, you, can these people really pull it off? A one week long study with very hard nosed uh, experts on all of the technology involved. Uh, and uh, that committee came back and said to NSF, yes, absolutely, you should do this. You should build two of them very far apart to be sure that what you're seeing is real. Uh, they said, there's no way that these guys can possibly uh, lead this project. You have to get a, a single leader who has uh, the authority to make decisions. And so we brought on Robbie Vogt, who uh, had been the first chief scientist uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, when uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was really uh, going great guns on uh, planetary science. Uh, and under his leadership, we wrote a proposal at the NSF saying we would build the facilities in which these uh, interferometers would live. We would then uh, build initial interferometers, which would be to have too much noise in them to likely see anything. We'd have to be, it would be very surprising if they saw anything. But we would learn enough from the initial interferometers that a subsequent generation of interferometers, advanced interferometers, uh, that we would then build uh, would have a high probability of success. And so we laid this out in 1989. That's a long time ago, but not as long a time ago as 1972 when Ray and I were beginning this. From 1990 to 1992, we had a struggle to get funded. And it's an interesting political story. Uh, but. Uh, by 92, and the National Science Foundation was convinced, Congress con was convinced, and they have backed this, the National Science Foundation and Congress, unequivocally ever since, from 1992 until our success in uh, 2015. Uh, we brought on Barry Barish, uh, who had much more experience with leading large projects to actually lead the construction uh, and the development of these interferometers. Uh, and he expanded our effort from a small uh, collaboration of something like uh, 50 scientists by the time he took over at Caltech and MIT to what is now 1,200 scientists and engineers in 80 institutions in 18 nations. And that is the LIGO collaboration today. So it's a big science project because Building these interferometers is such a complex job. It requires so many different kinds of expertise to make it happen successfully. Uh, under his leadership, we built the first, first interferometers, which didn't see anything, just as we predicted. Uh, then he was stolen away by the field of high energy physics to lead the design study for their next big project. Uh, and so we then had a, a subsequent pair of direct, very good directors, J. Marks, David Reitze, and under David Reitze's leadership, we installed the advanced interferometers uh, and that actually had the ultimate success, as we had expected. But uh, as an underpinning for being able to analyze the data that would come off LIGO, it was essential that we understand the collisions of two black holes, because uh, at least I was convinced, beginning in 1980, the first thing we would see would be colliding black holes. And we were not clever enough. Even people here at this uh, Center for Geometry and Physics were not clever enough to be able to solve Einstein's equations uh, to figure out what happens when two black holes collide and figure out the shapes of the waves that would come off. And you needed to have that in order that when you saw the waves, you could figure out what the source was. Were these black holes or not? Uh, how much did the black holes weigh? How fast were they spinning? And, and so forth. 
And so there is a big effort going on in parallel with this in the computational science and mathematics and mathematical physics community uh, to develop these computer simulations of colliding black holes and other sources. Uh, and uh, a key piece of this was done by a Caltech Cornell collaboration uh, that's called the SXS Project. And I'm going to be showing you some uh, movies from the SXS Project. I already showed you one movie. And I'll show you uh, the predicted signal from their uh, simulations by comparison with the, uh, with the observed signal. So September 14, 2015, the computer simulations were working. This, the first big search was supposed to begin several days later. And so they were just being tuned and brought into their final form, and a signal came in. And so the experimental team froze the configuration of these detectors, froze the, the, the precisely what state they were in, and said, our search has just begun, and we've just seen a signal. And uh, so that signal came in to the LIGO gravitational wave detector at Hanford, Washington. And this is what the signal looked like, uh, and with all its noise there, except that something called uh, bandpass filtering has been done on the signal. All the oscillations in the signal at frequencies higher than 300 hertz, 300 cycles per second, have been removed, and everything below 30 cycles per second has been removed. Otherwise, this is just the raw data with no effort to clean it up other than that. At our detector in Livingston, Louisiana, our detector in Hanford, Washington, you look at it uh, and compare them, and it's essentially the same signal. Uh, and then when the signal is cleaned up uh, through f uh, further filtering, it is the uh, gray band here, and the red is from the SXS numerical relativity simulation, solving Einstein's equations on computers. Beautiful agreement. Of course, uh, the actual uh, a uh, predicted signal depends on how heavy the black holes are and on their spins, but not so strongly on their spins. And so it's by comparing with the signals for different masses of black holes that we concluded that the two initial black holes were 29 and 36 times as heavy as the sun, so that's a total of 65 solar masses in bl these black holes. The final black hole was 62 solar masses, so three solar masses was lost as gravitational waves. That's what I told you, that uh, it was like annihilating three suns and turning all that energy into gravitational waves. And the distance we concluded from this comparison of the simulations with the observations was 1.3 billion light years. Since then, LIGO has seen six more, five more black hole collisions. Uh, with each, we know what the masses are, we know how far away is to the source. Uh, the most distant source that's been seen wave is about three billion light years away. Uh, and, uh, but the first ones were the heaviest ones that we've seen. But all of these things are pretty heavy black holes. And it's been a little surprising, the signals that the holes are so heavy. These are the actual signals. Uh, uh, and for small mass signals, the signal lasts a lot longer in the LIGO frequency band that LIGO can see. For the heavy ones, it not lasts much shorter. Because basically, if they're heavy, they emit stronger waves. They spiral together in a, uh, faster in the LIGO frequency band. Uh, it's very important to know where these signals are in the sky so that the electromagnetic astronomers, or their optical telescopes, their X-ray telescopes, and so forth, can go search for them. And uh, with just two detect, uh, we, we determine where it is on the sky primarily by the delay time in when the signal arrives at two detectors. I told you the first signal uh, arrived in Livingston, Louisiana, seven milliseconds before it arrived in Hanford, Washington. That means the signal was traveling from south toward north. And looking at the data more carefully, it was concluded, as I told you, that it entered the Earth somewhere near the Antarctic Peninsula, near the South Pole. Uh, but we did not know uh, with any precision where it was. The on the sky, the uncertainty in where it was is this big box inside. It was somewhere inside of there. However, uh, in August of last year, a third gravitational wave detector of this type went into operation successfully. It's called the Virgo detector. It's a detector built by 19 labs, 250 uh, scientists in France, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, and this detector, adding in the uh, observations from Virgo, 
uh, we were able to get an error box far, far smaller because we could now triangulate with uh, three detectors on where it was. And we concluded it was inside that tiny error box. So we were finally then in a position to really tell the electromagnetic astronomers where to look on the sky. I should say this error box is somewhat big, but not a lot bigger than the moon. So it's not all that small, but it's still small enough that the astronomers could go look uh, with some confidence to say whether there was something there or not. And there was nothing there uh, with light, uh, radio waves, x-rays. However, LIGO is also seen as LIGO and Virgo have all is made from almost pure nuclear matter. It has the density at the center of roughly 10 times higher than the nucleus of an atom. Uh, they have a diameter of something like 20 or 30 kilometers. So that's not very big. Uh, and uh, they have masses of about one and a half times what the sun weighs. They're really strange stars, very compact and very good sources of gravitational waves. And they went around and around each other. This is an artist's conception. This is not from a simulation. It's an artist's conception uh, by an artist at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Went around and around each other. They collided and merged and created a fireball that went expanding outward. And that fireball was initially very dense and hot, and nothing could get out of it because it was so dense and hot, except gravitational waves. Uh, but then, uh, uh, after the gravitational, uh, uh, the f fireball became transparent initially to gamma rays. 1.7 seconds after the collision, a gamma ray burst came off. And the error box on the sky for the gamma ray burst was this great big thing, our error box uh, for the gravitational waves was this much smaller thing. And then x-rays were seeing ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio waves all coming off a little galaxy sitting down here inside the LIGO Virgo error box. Uh, there had been predictions previously of what would happen when two neutron stars collide. And those predictions, well, this is called Mulder messenger astronomy because it, the messengers are the various kinds of radiation, and it uses many different kinds of radiation. 15% of the world's astronomers observed this thing. This was the most observed phenomenon that there has ever been in astronomy. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the prediction is that it is in these kinds of collisions that uh, most of the gold and platinum and other precious metals that are here on Earth are produced. They're produced by these collisions and by nuclear processes. Uh, that occur in the, uh, these collisions. Uh, and in fact, the observations, the electromagnetic observations, bear that out. There's strong confirmation that, 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 uh, that these precious metals were produced in this collision. And with this, we were also able to begin to measure things about the universe. The rate of expansion of the universe from this one event was able to be measured not as well as the electromagnetic observers measure it with enormous effort over periods of many, many years. But this one event got nearly as good at measuring the expansion rate of the universe as, uh, as is done with enormous effort using only light. So this began to tell, it, t tell us that there's going to be wonderful things done uh, with combined electromagnetic and gravitational waves. Uh, just a few photos of the instrumentation. This is a scene from uh, the air, the LIGO detector at Hanford, Washington. Down inside this building, uh, Barry Barish, our uh, dire famous director, put a baseball player down there so you can see how big this uh, is. He thought it'd be better to put a baseball player than a LIGO scientist. And uh, so these mirrors are hanging inside these chambers and the laser beams are going up and down in, in these vacuum pipes. This is one of the mirrors that weighs 40 kilograms, close to 100 pounds. These instruments are very complex. Uh, they have 100,000 channels of data coming out of them, telling you what's going on inside the instrument. The reason that they're so complex is there's so many things can go wrong. That, that's why I didn't believe at first it would be possible at all. So many things can go wrong when you're measuring such exquisitely tiny motions of these mirrors. And so you had to deal in advance, be prepared to deal with everything that could possibly go wrong. Uh, but that means that, in fact, uh, these detectors, because they're so complex, they have a personality of their own. And the experimenters built the detectors 
but it's sort of like uh, Victor Frankenstein who built his creature didn't know the creature's personality until after he'd built the creature uh, and then learned the creature's personality. The experimenters built these complex instruments and didn't fully understand the personality of the instruments. And so LIGO was now shut down for about 16 months while the experimenters poke and prod at the instrument trying to understand its personality and thereby improve its sensitivity toward the actual uh, sensitivity it was designed to have. Uh, and uh, so they're coaxing. And uh, this next uh, gravitational wave search will begin early next year, uh, and then there will be uh, one more after that that get us to design sensitivity. Design sensitivity, it will see, these instruments will see three times farther. They'll see a volume of the universe then that is three cubed or 27 times bigger than what we're now seeing. So at the present time when these instruments are operating, we see about one black hole collision per month. And by 2020, we'll see one a day. So that's impressive what's happening in the future. All right. By 2020, we should be seeing gravitational waves from spinning neutron stars that have little mountains on their surfaces. These are also pulsars, and we will compare uh, radio waves, possibly X-rays, and gravitational waves from these pulsars. We will watch black holes tear neutron stars apart. The black hole and neutron star going around each other, spiraling together, and the black hole literally tears the neutron star apart. Uh, and thereby, we will probe the properties of the neutron stars uh, and learn interesting things about this supernuclear matter. We have already seen neutron stars collide. At some point, and these are much more rare, we will see gravitational waves and particles called neutrinos from the cores of what are called supernova explosions. And we thereby will begin to understand what really causes a supernova explosion. And as I've said before, there are going to be enormous surprises. So this gives you some sense of what I'm expecting in the next few years. But we will do much better than that in the future uh, if we're only limited by technology and not by money. And so far, that has been the case but it's not obvious it's going to continue to be the case. Uh, then uh, in the early 2020s, we will be, have an improvement called LIGO A+. And uh, I was just told, by, I had dinner last night with the director of the National Science Foundation, and she told me uh, that uh, they, she thinks they're going to go forward with the funding of LIGO A+, in the very near future. Uh, and with that, we will be seeing black hole collisions a few per day by the late 2020s, we could have the next generation of these gravitational wave detectors uh, and be seeing black hole collisions once an hour. And by the 2030s, we should have a fourth generation, which should see every black hole collision in the universe with black hole masses less than about 1,000 solar masses. Everyone in the entire universe, going back to the earliest formation of these black holes long, long, long ago. So this gives you some sense of the speed with which uh, uh, we expect uh, to go from the handful of uh, collisions that we've seen thus far to enormous amounts of data and many, many other kinds of sources that we will see. And it's not just these kinds of detectors uh, that we're, are going to be in operation. By uh, the 2030s, we should have three other kinds of gravity wave detectors in three other frequency bands. It's as though we had begun optical astronomy, radio astronomy, x-ray astronomy, and uh, gamma ray astronomy all over a period of 20 years. We're going to do the an analog of this with gravitational waves. LIGO sees gravitational waves with periods of oscillation of milliseconds. An analog of LIGO is spacecraft in, uh, in orbit around the sun that track each other with laser beams. Separation of the spacecraft, not of many kilometers, but of uh, uh, millions of kilometers would see gravitational waves with periods of oscillations of minutes to hours. This is like optical astronomy, that's like radio astronomy. Uh, something called pulsar timing arrays, uh, radio telescopes looking at an array of pulsars, objects called pulsars on the sky. When gravitational waves sweep over the Earth, they uh, basically, roughly speaking, they make the rate of flow of all the clocks on Earth speed up and then slow down, the speed up and then slow down. And so it appears to us that these pulsars, which have very regular pulses, that they all slow down, then speed up, then slow down, speed up in unison. 
uh, that will be used to see, uh, uh, that, that is in a fairly mature state. I think within the next five years, they will be seeing gravitational waves with periods of years to decades. And then at the very end, I'll talk about seeing gravitational waves with periods of hundreds of millions to billions of years using a different technique. But I'm going to conclude by a few remarks about uh, some of the science we're going to do with these gravitational wave detectors, first exploring black holes and then exploring the birth of the universe. So a black hole is made from warped space and time. That's a little hard to wrap your head around. So if you go into the fifth dimension of the movie Interstellar, or the fourth spatial dimension, you're looking in on our universe from a higher dimension, and you just look at the, the, the orbital plane, or I'm sorry, you look at the equatorial plane of a black hole, the uh, space around the black hole looks like a funnel like this. Uh, out here, this becomes very flat. Our universe is out here, and where the black hole is, there's a funnel that goes down, as seen from, uh, the, uh, from the higher dimension. Down here, the horizon, or the surface of the black hole, is down here where it's black. It's, it looks like a circle here, but it's actually a flattened sphere, because remember, I removed one dimension. I said, we're just looking at the equatorial plane. And if you restore the other dimension, the circle becomes a sphere. Uh, the uh, black hole has warped time. Time slows near the horizon. So if you're at the yellow point, time is slowing at 10% the rate that it is far away. And down at the horizon, time is slowed to a halt. And the spin of the black hole drags, sp drags space into a whirling motion fast near the horizon, slower far away, proportional to the lengths of these arrows. That's like the air in a tornado whirling around and around. And so it's ra rather remarkable. This is what a black hole is. These three phenomena, the warping of space, the slowing of time, and the whirling motion of space. Uh, Lisa has the possibility to see giant black holes of masses of millions of suns, more, but more, more interestingly, small black holes orbiting around giant black holes uh, and gradually spiraling in to the, and plunging through the horizon. If I remove the, uh, the warping of space and just look at the orbit, if I could have the lights down, uh, you see the orbit around here. It looks nothing like lights off. It looks nothing like the uh, elliptical orbits of our planets around our sun. That, these orbits just explore the entire space around the black hole. Uh, and, with, uh, and in the process, they put onto the gravitational waves that the small hole emits a full map of the space-time geometry of the big black hole that the small black hole is exploring as it goes around and around. So we can bring the lights back up again. And what if the central body is not a black hole, for example, a hypothetical so-called naked singularity, then the orbits can be wildly different. For example, this inner orbit is what we call chaotic. And the maps that you will extract from the observational data will be wildly different from uh, what it is with the central black hole. So we have, with LISA, we expect to map the geometries of space and time around these black holes with exquisite precision in the same way as NASA has mapped the surfaces of Mars and of Venus. And we also already are exploring the dynamics of space-time geometry when two black holes collide. So here is a similar diagram of two black holes going around each other uh, with the, the shapes, uh, the warping of space shown by the surfaces seen from a higher dimension, uh, and the color coding showing the slowing of time. Uh, and uh, this is slowed down. This is a uh, a picture from a computer simulation for the first black hole collision ever seen by LIGO. It's like a gigantic storm at sea, a huge splash at the moment of collision and merger, and then an oscillation, and it dies out. And it was that, that's the warping of space and time that produced three solar masses worth of gravitational waves. So we're in the process observationally of watching the wild oscillations in the shape of space and in the rate of flow of time that occur when black holes collide. Finally, a few words about exploring the birth of the universe. I'm going to give you uh, a couple of examples. When the universe was one trillionth of a second old, 
theory tells us that that was when the electromagnetic force was born. Electricity and magnetism didn't even exist before that. The universe had to live for a trillionth of a second before they were born. Uh, and they were born in what is called electroweak phase transition. And just to use a technical phrase, if that phase transition was uh, first order, which is a phrase that, uh, that uh, I'm not going to explain, but it may, may well have been. Then electromagnetism was born inside bubbles, like bubbles of water that condense out of water vapor. But these bubbles, unlike water, uh, unlike water bubbles, the moment they're born, they start expanding at close to the speed of light. They expand, they collide, and in the collisions, they produce gravitational waves. Now, those gravitational waves have very short wavelengths, but this was very long ago when the universe was a lot smaller than it is today. And since then, the universe has expanded by a huge amount, and the wavelength has been stretched. And those waves today are in the frequency domain or the wavelength domain of LISA. So at LISA, uh, we expect to go out and try to see the gravitational waves born when the new laws of physics were created, when electromagnetism and the laws that govern electromagnetism came into being, were born, when the universe was a trillionth of a second old. Gravitational waves from the very birth of the universe will be detected, I expect, in two different ways uh, over the coming several decades. The first one will be in this way. Uh, something came off the Big Bang uh, in terms of gravitational waves. Conventional wisdom says it is just random fluctuations associated with quantum mechanics, so tiny, tiny fluctuations. But we have rather strong observational evidence and uh, strong theoretical reason to believe that uh, in the first 10 to the minus 33 seconds, unbelievable, at least short period of time, the universe expanded extremely rapidly in what is called inflation. And that inflation is predicted to have amplified whatever came off the Big Bang. So if it was only just random quantum mechanical fluctuations came off the Big Bang, still the uh, inflation amplified that to produce a strong uh, spectrum of gravitational waves that traveled outward through the universe uh, as the universe expanded. When the universe was about 400,000 years old, they interacted with hot gas that was in the process of becoming neutral. And electrons and protons were combining with each other to form hydrogen. This was the birth of hydrogen in the early universe at that age. And the gravitational waves are predicted to have put a, a pattern of what is called polarization on, these, uh, on the electromagnetic waves that were being liberated uh, from this hot plasma as the hot plasma uh, uh, recombined to form neutral hydrogen. And that polarization pattern is being searched for by, uh, by astronomers today and has been found, but there is noise in there that is produced in a certain manner by dust in interstellar space. And the uh, observers are in the process of trying to clean that noise out of there so they can be sure what it is that they're seeing. But what they will see, be seeing is, a, what, a tech, to use a technical phrase, a convolution, but a combination of the influence of what actually came off the Big Bang and the influence of inflation. And so then the challenge is going to be to look at those data and say, well, is the thing that came off the Big Bang just random fluctuations or was it something else? And what was inflation doing? By about the 2050s, we expect to have a follow-on mission to LISA that with a constellation of spacecraft in orbit around the sun, which will directly measure those gravitational waves from the earliest moments of the universe. But uh, the uh, previous method sees them with periods of millions of years. Of course, that's longer than the uh, lifetime of a scientist. But you see them by the pattern of polarization on the sky. These you will see with periods of a few seconds. So radically different periods looking at the same thing, the very birth of the universe. And so we will then be studying the birth of the universe, the birth of the fundamental forces with these gravitational wave detectors over the coming few decades, as well as many, many other things and big surprises. Let me just conclude by saying it was 400 years ago when Galileo 
built his optical telescope, pointed at the sky and discovered the moons of Jupiter, and all pointed at the moon, our moon, discovered the craters on our moon. Uh, it is about two years ago that the LIGO scientists uh, turned on our gravitational wave detectors and discovered gravitational waves from colliding black holes. There are only two kinds of waves, according to theory, that can be uh, travel across the universe, bringing us information about what's far away, electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. So LIGO has done what Galileo did. Galileo did it for electromagnetic waves. LIGO has done it for gravitational waves. What we have learned from LIGO bears little resemblance to Galileo's understanding. It, we've learned so much more, so many big surprises, and I invite you to speculate what will be seen with gravitational waves over the next 400 years. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Well, one question that sometimes comes to mind is, uh, how did you know that you were not hacked when you make the first detection? <laughs> <laughs> so I told you that these, there were 100,000 data channels come out of uh, the instrument and the electronics. And the very best hackers who are members of the, who are members of the team if they try to hack in any way whatsoever, they will put fingerprints, they'll put, they'll put, put uh, distortions onto some of these data channels. So I told you it took a number of months for the team to decide this was real. And they were spending most of that time looking at all these other data channels, looking for fingerprints from hackers. And there were no fingerprints, there were, there were no peculiarities at all. And uh, so I can't say I'm with 100% confidence that we weren't hacked. But I can say that there is no scientist that we know who would be capable, uh, in the, even the most knowledgeable ones about these instruments, who could, who could hack it without leaving fingerprints, and there were no fingerprints. A question for you is that what do you theorize what happens to objects or people like if they were to enter a black hole because I've seen documentaries about it and you know it's kind of always open-ended so since you know so much about it I want to see what you think. So uh, this is a, a question that I discuss in my book The Science of Interstellar. So if you've seen some of you will have seen the movie Interstellar and the, uh, that movie is based on uh, science that I put into the movie from the very outset. So I was part of the team that did this movie. Uh, and as we now understand, and I describe in there, there are three singularities inside a black hole. Uh, these are places where, uh, where the... Well, you, I think most of you know that if you get an astronaut near a black hole, the astronaut's supposed to be stretched from head to feet and squeezed from the side. So these are places where that stretching and squeezing be, becomes infinitely strong. Uh, one of those singularities is very chaotic and very destructive, and no way you would survive it. But the two others are more gentle, in the words of Romilly, who is the uh, theoretical physicist who goes... Uh, on the mission in the movie Interstellar and gets killed by a robot named Kip that explodes. So Romilly says there are general singularities inside there and that, uh, that Matthew McConaughey, or Cooper I guess it is, should uh, go in and explore those singularities trying to learn about laws of physics in order to control gravity. So uh, the two general singularities uh, the stretching and squeezing are infinitely strong but they happen so fast that you're only stretched by a finite amount, squeezed by a finite amount. If that finite amount, uh, finite amount is small enough, you might survive. If you survive, we have no idea what happens because we don't know how to solve the equations if, when you get past there. Um, so I think it's unlikely you would survive, but it's not totally out of the question. And so we use that in, in, in the movie. So, well, in the movie, uh, Cooper uh, is lifted out of our dimension into the bulk, into this, uh, this uh, higher dimension, and brought back to Earth by a vehicle created by a higher civilization. That's kind of speculative. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
but, but it's, again, not ruled out, not ruled out. I, I, I can lay down a mathematical model for the universe in, in which this could happen that doesn't violate any, anything that we currently know. Uh, but I think it's very unlikely. I think it's very unlikely. Um, but this issue of what, in fact, does happen inside a black hole at these singularities is tremendously important because the singularities are controlled by a set of physical laws that we don't understand, called the laws of quantum gravity, that people here at uh, this center work hard on, among other, among other things. Uh, and uh, these phenomena in nature, they're controlled by these laws that we would really like to understand. They control the birth of the universe, and that's why it's so important to be able to see the gravitational waves from the birth of the universe, because that tells us something about these laws. They control what happens inside uh, black holes. Uh, and they also control whether or not you can go backward in time. Yeah. Um, what would you theorize that space is expanding into itself? Like, how is it growing if there is nothingness? And if there is nothingness, how will it grow to be something? So, uh, if there really is a bulk, if there really is a higher dimension, and I, I, show, I showed the shape of a black hole as seen from a higher dimension, if there really is that higher dimension, then it's expanding into that higher dimension. But we live in our universe, which is a, has three space dimensions, and we can't get out of those three space dimensions, so we can't get out into the bulk to look in and watch it expand. All we can actually make measurements of is what's going on in our universe, uh, and so we can't say, based on observations, whether there is such a bulk, uh, at least not any straightforward observations. And it's possible it doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, uh, then nevertheless the universe is expanding. You see the same thing inside our universe as you would if there is a bulk into which it's expanding. Oh, the theory is that at the most bottom layer right now that time completely stops and it's completely just morphed and stops, but how will it, like, do we have any comprehension of what would be on, like, like beyond that at all? So Maybe if it was yeah. viewed at, like, another dimension or spectrum. So general relativity says, uh, <clears throat> is incapable of describing what happens to time at a singularity or in the birth of the universe. The, birth of the universe is also born in a singularity. Time, in some sense, appears to have been created with the birth of the universe and didn't exist previously and will stop existing uh, in the singularity inside a black hole or any other singularity. That's not, I, I'm confident, and I think all of my colleagues are confident, that's not really true, but that's what Einstein's laws say. But Einstein's laws fail in these singularities, and they have to be replaced by these laws of quantum gravity, obtained by combining Einstein's description of curved space-time, warp space-time, with laws of quantum mechanics. And so the laws of quantum gravity will someday tell us what happens to time in reality, uh, how it's transmuted, or, or, or what really happens. We just don't know as yet. All we know is the predictions of Einstein's laws that it will cease to exist. But uh, and I don't believe those predictions. I presume you don't believe those predictions either. <laughs> Thank you. I may ask another question. Out of curiosity, imagine that this, the first merger of black holes happened at a distance from, like, we are from the sun, okay, and we were orbiting in our planet Earth around it. How would this tidal effect affect us? We wouldn't feel it at that distance. Uh, the, uh, if you're up close to the black holes, it would be very unpleasant. <laughs> very unpleasant. Here we would not be stretched much. <laughs> but so. but uh, the, the wavelength of these waves uh, was something like 1,000 kilometers or so. Uh, and with that kind of wavelength, uh, that means that the, they become waves at a distance of a, of a thousand or a few thousand kilometers away from the colliding black holes. And they're not waves, uh, closer to, than that, they're not propagating as waves. They're what we call a near-zone gravitational field, which is somewhat different. 
And in that near zone, before they become waves, as they're, as they're uh, becoming waves, but that, that, uh, that's where you, you, you would die. Okay? It, would, it, would be, it would not be pleasant at all. But by the time you get into the wave zone, it's a small enough uh, stretching and squeezing that you survive perfectly well. You survive for two reasons. One is that the stretching and squeezing by then is pretty small. The second reason is that uh, if something is shaking you at a rate of a few hundred oscillations per second, you don't hardly notice it because it's shaking too fast and your body doesn't respond very well. And it's used in electronics sometimes between your body and the gravitational wave. So there are those two factors that, uh, that, that save you if, if, if it were at the location of the sun. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I have a question about the LIGO experiment and how it is that we actually get to, to uh, how it is that uh, anything is measured at all. So in the LIGO experiment, you're looking at the difference in, uh, in stretching and squeezing in one direction and then perpendicular to it. So if there were, if you were measuring that using a ruler, like a meter stick, my understanding is that uh, is it true to that a meter stick then would stretch because a meter stick would have atoms that are affected by gravity and probably by space that the meter stick itself would stretch as well? No, because the meter stick has atomic forces inside it that prevent it from stretching. Uh, and so if you could compare with a meter stick, you would clearly see the stretching and squeezing. The mirrors... The mirrors move apart and together because we have carefully hung them by wires, so they're free to move horizontally. Uh, but a meter stick is not free to stretch. The problem with light is it also uh, is free to stretch and squeeze, and the li light trapped between these mirrors, which is the way we do it, does stretch and squeeze. And so then there is a big issue that has caused a lot of confusion. How can LIGO possibly work if you're using light? that is uh, temporarily trapped between the mirrors as they uh, go back and forth. And so the answer to that is we use fresh light uh, and put in fresh light at least uh, once every half cycle of oscillation. So when, there, when this pair of mirrors is, uh, has been stretched apart, we're using one set of light and we extract it uh, before the mirrors are pushed together. And so we use fresh light over and over and over again. Uh, and, and so it does work, uh, but it, it required that we do that. If you do a detailed analysis of the detector and you use light that is trapped for longer than uh, one oscillation of stretching and squeezing, your sensitivity goes away. You can't do it. You, it the, the instrument starts to fail. So the electromagnetic waves themselves, they are affected by... Uh, by the distances, just as everything around is also affected. Yes. But, but, but a, solid, a solid ruler will not be. And if you use fresh light over and over again, then you're okay. But that's an example of some of the cleverness that has to be done in order to pull this off. <clears throat> um. Before the Big Bang, when uh, essentially the whole universe was in a dense mass, and since gravity pretty much wants to pull everything together, what would have caused the gravity to reverse and cause the Big Bang, causing everything to expand into the universe today? Only the laws of quantum gravity know. We don't know. Uh, there are speculations. There are various models based on uh, our current incomplete understanding of laws of quantum gravity. Uh, but there certainly is no consensus on this. And uh, so th I think there's a, a book by Martin Re There may be other thing, others, but there's a book by Martin Rees a few years ago that describes various possibilities that, uh, uh, that uh, come from different peoples looking at uh, quantum gravity from different points of view. Uh, but these are the, uh, this is an example of the deep questions uh, that rely on the laws of physics that we don't yet understand. So there's, there's plenty of elbow room, plenty of things for uh, the next generation of uh, scientists to, to work on. 
Thank you. So let me just say there are no stupid questions. So if you have a question that you think is stupid, it's not stupid. You should always re feel free to ask it. <laughs> okay, we we have one here. <laughs> <laughs> so, in saying that light is is free to move uh, with these gravitational forces, and when you have an object so far away from our viewing standpoint, it lighter than what is currently happening at that position. So, in terms of direction within space, since these are free to stretch and shrink, would that alter the direction that we see it as? If it's like, say, we see it here, would it be actually over in a different direction since we these gravitational waves are affecting the way that light is being perceived by us well it could be in a different direction because the because the source has moved in the intervening period in the what last 1.3 billion years and so all we can say is where the source was 1.3 billion years ago uh, we can't say that with perfect precision because these gravitational waves propagate along paths similar to light paths, which can be bent uh, when traveling around a, a, a massive other object. And so it's, there is some amount of bending of the path of uh, the gravitational waves, and uh, you don't know how much of that is, but the estimates that we make say that that effect is, is quite small, and so uh, much smaller than the uncertainty uh, in our estimates of where the source is coming from. Uh, what, do you, what exactly do you mean when you say time is being warped? Where, where are you? I'm right here. <laughs> I, where is right here? Okay, you could stand up. but uh, Do you want me to stand? Yes, thank All you. Right. <laughs> okay. um, what exactly do you mean when you say time is being warped? Like, I know that you mean the, the stretching and the squeezing of the uh, gravitational waves, but what exactly do you mean when you say time is so, being warped? Uh, it would be better to say that time is slowed down or speeded up. The analog of stretching and squeezing is slowing and speeding of the rate of flow of time. So, uh, for example, the rate of flow of time on the surface of the Earth is slower than up at very high altitude. Slower by about one second in one century. That's, it's a T, wee, wee, tiny bit slower. Uh, the rate of flow of time near a black hole is enormously slower than far away. Um, and so time is, uh, warping of time includes that slowing of time, but uh, in the colliding black holes, there was an oscillation of the rate of flow of time. So if you, and you see these, the effect of the slowing by just comparing the ticking rates of clocks at high altitude and on the surface of the Earth, which has been done to very high precision already in, the, in 1976, uh, NASA flew atomic clocks in a rocket up to, uh, I've forgotten how high, several Earth radii, I think, and, uh, and then the just, rockets just fell back down. Uh, and the clocks then, uh, in the rocket, the ticking rate was compared with clocks, atomic clocks back at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And as predicted, uh, the, the clock in the rocket was ticking faster than down on Earth. And the accuracy of the experiment already in 1976 was part, one part in 10,000. Even though that difference is just uh, one second in a century, the accuracies of atomic clocks are really amazing. So as a human, if you were in a place where time was warped uh, in a very different way than as time is here on Earth, would you be able to sense that while you're in that place? You'd sense it by comparing yourself with somebody on Earth. Uh, the classic twins paradox, you go out from here, travel out at high speed and come back, and uh, 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 you are still alive, but uh, your uh, friends have long since died because time has uh, flowed faster here on Earth than for you going out and coming back. Or you go down near a black hole and stay, uh, in the case of interstellar, you stay near a black hole for uh, an hour, and you come back, and ten, seven years have passed on Earth. Um, Thank you.
So uh, in Interstellar, when uh, Cooper goes into the uh, higher dimension, it is showed that he is the one essentially giving like the signals to uh, Murphy and his past self, like where to go to find the uh, space center that sends him on that mission. Uh, essentially, that would cause an infinite loop of him going to that point in time and giving himself the signals. So what would cause the original one sending him to the... Uh, different aspects of this, of this business, and uh, th that, that is one of the more difficult ones. Um, all, all we can say, all I can say with considerable confidence is if you can have information traveling backward in time, which is what happens there, uh, then uh, everything has to be self-consistent. Uh, and so a analog of that is the classic thing where uh, I uh, go backward in time and try to kill my grandfather before I, my mother was conceived. Uh, I can't, we think. If, if, or maybe a more honest way to say it is, if backward time travel is possible, and if uh, I, you do can go back and uh, kill your grandfather before your mother was conceived, then I may as well give up as a theoretical physicist. I can't predict anything. Uh, so, but these, kind, these kinds of questions are deep questions that uh, about the issue of backward time travel, and as I told you before, uh, we're pretty sure that whether or not you can have backward time travel is controlled by the laws of quantum gravity, and only when we have those laws, I think, will we have clear answers to questions like this. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, so we saw gravitational wave detections from black hole mergers, and then which are fairly massive. They were like 30 mass of the sun. And then we saw it also gravitational wave detection from neutron star mergers, which are considerably less massive than black holes. I guess my question is, is there a theoretical limit on how massive something needs to be to generate a gravitational wave? Uh, there is only in this sense that uh, everything in the universe, we believe, obeys laws of quantum mechanics. and They give rise to the classical behavior of the world, which, including gravitational waves. That means, if, if this is correct, that uh, gravitational waves are actually made up of huge numbers of quanta, called gravitons, that carry the waves. Uh, if you do a calculation of the strength of gravitational waves that you can produce by waving your fist, you'll discover that you e emit at something like less than one graviton per year. And so you're not a very good gravitational wave emitter. And so this, this quantum behavior is the ultimate thing that uh, says, yeah, there's a limit of how massive and how fast you have to move, move a mass to produce a gravitational wave. Uh, the things we're looking at, black holes and neutron stars, are very far from that regime. The number of uh, gravitons that interacted with our gravitational wave detector from these colliding black holes it was huge. It's something like 10 to the 43 gravitons. Uh, absolutely huge number. So we're enormously far away from, from that limit. Uh, yeah. One last question. Do all gravitational waves travel at the same speed? And if so, what speed would that be? So uh, theory predicts that they should all travel at the speed of light, the same speed as light. It's a speed that's built into the very structure of space and time. It's, uh, and uh, so uh, gravitational waves and light, electromagnetic waves in vacuum, uh, they're controlled by that structure of space and time and travel at that same speed. But you can ask the question, uh, what do we know about this observationally? Uh, if these gravitons that I spoke about are not, have some finite rest mass, that means if you stopped a graviton, it still exists, then you would expect, according to the laws of physics, that the lower frequency waves that oscillate more slowly will travel slower than the high frequency waves. And that means that if you begin with, uh, uh, with gravitational waves produced by these colliding black holes, 1.3 billion light years from Earth, 
and they traveled for 1.3 billion years, if you had even the very tiniest difference in the rate of propagation of the higher frequency waves, say waves that oscillate at a few hundred oscillations per second versus the waves that oscillate, say, at, uh, at 50 oscillations per second, tiny, tiny difference, uh, those waves oscillating together produce the distorted, and they would not have agreed with the computer simulations. So simply the remarkable agreement between the computer simulation waveforms and the observed waveforms places a very tight constraint on, uh, and says that the higher frequency waves and lower frequency waves are propagating at the same speed to enormous, enormous precision. Yeah, this is... Uh... This is kind of a general question. Where are you? I'm looking for you. Okay. Uh, but now that we can actually record and analyze gravitational waves, do you have any predictions as to what new areas of investigation we can get into because of it? Well, so I think what we're really going to be doing is ex primarily is exploring the universe. And I gave you a sense of two things that I find particularly ex exciting. Exploring observationally the earliest moments of the universe and exploring properties of black holes. But there will be many, many other things that we will explore. Uh, we will be looking for uh, a phenomena that might or might not have occurred in the early universe, something called cosmic strings, for example, and uh, domain walls. These are defects in the structure of space that might have uh, been created in the very early universe, and, but not, might not be around enough to see in any other way today that would produce gravitational waves. So we'll be looking for, uh, or another example is, if our universe really is a three-dimensional surface, call it a surface, in a higher dimensional space, uh, and if it was born wrinkled, then what we expect is that uh, as the universe ages, it will vibrate in the higher dimensions. As it vibrates in the higher dimensions, those vibrations, part of the vibrations will be in the form of gravitational waves that come from, from these vibrations. So these are the kinds of wild speculations that just might be true, that we'll be, uh, we'll be looking for other ways from that. Uh, but we will, the bread and butter of this is going to be joint, the, the, the everyday observations uh, will be joint observations between electromagnetic detectors, neutrino detectors, and gravitational wave detectors similar to what we saw in the neutron star collisions. And we'll be just exploring neutron stars and black holes and other phenomena uh, in the universe today uh, that we have, weren't able to explore in other ways previously. So this is going to become a very rich and diverse area of uh, cosmological and, and astronomical observations. And that's going to be happening quite quickly over the coming uh, few years. Uh,